And at the end of the day, all of the different tools that you use, PEMF, laser, red light, hydrogen, water, or gas, hyperbaric oxygen, EWAT, sauna, cold plunge, all of these different modalities play a role or could play a role in that process. And so rather than just guessing which one of these tools do I need and how often or when, we could start to understand which ones you actually need the most and you could start focusing your energy properly and creating protocols that are actually meaningful for you because the steps in that process of electron transport that I need are likely to be very different than the steps in the electron transport that you need. So we get a lot of questions about how do we improve our health, where does hyperbaric oxygen actually fit in this model? We're constantly trying to answer questions around improving people's health, people who are already healthy, trying to maintain or improve their health over time. Or of course, also people that are chronically ill and how do we improve their health or start moving them away from whatever disease process is starting to show up for them. And one of the most important things I think I could drive home is that in most cases, the same steps that a healthy person would wanna take to maintain their health or improve their health are very similar, if not almost identical, to the steps that somebody who has a chronic illness would need to take in order to improve their health as well. Now, those steps might be larger steps or the frequency and duration of certain therapies we would use might be longer duration and more intense in terms of the actual therapies themselves. But at the end of the day, they would be very similar steps. And really what a lot of this comes down to, and most of you probably already know this, is reducing inflammation and improving mitochondrial function. Inflammation destroys our cells, our cell membranes, causes DNA damage, epigenetic damage, and mitochondria are in charge of producing energy. And virtually every cell in our body, other than red blood cells, have a mitochondria and use that mitochondria to make the energy that they need in order to do whatever their job is. Let's say this is a liver function. Well, liver cells need to produce energy, let's say, to detoxify. Let's say brain cells. Brain cells need to create energy in order to produce neurotransmitters or create synapse connections with nearby neurons to carry information. Muscle cells need to produce energy in order to create movement for your body. So all of your cells, again, other than red blood cells, require mitochondria to make energy. And one of the most important common denominators is low energy in our cells, allowing our cells to become dysfunctional, ultimately senescent, and not contributing to normal healthy function any longer, allowing our body to degenerate over time. So in this video, what we're gonna be talking about is healthy mitochondrial function. How does the mitochondria work? How do we feed ourselves? And how do we then pull energy out of the food that we're eating so that our cells can create ATP or cellular energy to do their job. Most of the tools and modalities that you're interested in, obviously hyperbaric being one of them, but we've talked about red light and sauna and cold and PEMF, all these other amazing tools that we use either in our clinic or that you have access to in your life. Where do they show up in the different phases of energy production? And then how do we purposefully use these tools to make sure that we're maximizing mitochondrial function over the years and decades of our life? So here we go. When I'm lecturing about this often in classes, I compare cellular metabolism, which is the breakdown of our food to extract energy or produce energy from that, to combustion of a car engine. Similarly, an engine needs to bring in fuel, oxidize it with oxygen, and produce power. And that's how a car generates power to move down the road. And then it has waste products, which are carbon dioxide and water. In our bodies, very similarly, we need fuel. We'll call that food. So we put fuel into the system. We need oxygen to oxidize it. We get that through breathing. And we mix oxygen and that fuel source in a way to help extract power and energy. We also have waste products. Those waste products are water and carbon dioxide. Very, very similar process, okay? More steps to the process, but similar overall. So we take in food. In general, all the food that we eat is a combination of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Now, we can extract energy from any one of those sources, but primarily carbohydrates and fat are mostly used for energy production, while protein is predominantly used for repair. So we take in these food products and then from the glucose and the fats, we're able to extract energy. How does that happen? Well, we first break down fats and carbohydrates into their most basic and fundamental unit. So carbohydrates 
get broken down into glucose and fats could ultimately be broken down into fatty acids. Once they're broken into their basic unit, they go into the cell and now the cell can actually further the metabolism to extract energy. And so what we do for a glucose molecule is it goes through a process called glycolysis. And for a fat molecule, it goes through a process called beta oxidation. Once those two units get broken down a little bit further, they're able to leave the cell and go into directly into the mitochondria. And then once in the mitochondria, they go through further processing. And so they go through a process called the Krebs cycle. And what that Krebs cycle does is it basically breaks down the carbon and hydrogen backbone. And when it does that, it releases one of those waste products we were talking about. It releases carbon dioxide. But the other thing that's produced during the Krebs cycle is a compound known as NADH and FADH2. NAD you may have heard of in terms of NADIV or NAD precursors like NR or NMN. And so this NADH is this high energy molecule. And ultimately, NADH or FADH2 as being high energy molecules, those are the compounds that we need to initiate the steps of the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is the final process in the mitochondria of producing ATP. And all it is is a series of moving electrons. So we bring these high energy molecules, NADH and FADH2, they donate their electrons to the first step. And you could picture it as a factory. And basically we drop in these raw materials and these raw materials need to move down the assembly line and if we have enough energy density at the beginning, enough raw material to dump into the system, it should be able to flow down its concentration gradient and move electrons down each step, ultimately creating what's called a hydrogen gradient. And that's the last step to ATP production. And so the question is, from the raw materials to each step along the factory, where are all the rate limiting steps? A rate limiting step is a part of the process that if there wasn't enough material or a worker doing the processing, it would be a stop in the factory production line. And so how do we make sure that we're dumping in enough raw materials? And how do we make sure each step of the factory is sufficient in energy and power so that every step can do its job, ultimately leading to high levels of ATP production? And at the end of the day, as I said earlier, all of the different tools that you use, PEMF, laser, red light, hydrogen, water, or gas, hyperbaric oxygen, EWAT, sauna, cold plunge, all of these different modalities play a role or could play a role in that process. And so rather than just guessing which one of these tools do I need and how often or when, we could start to understand which ones you actually need the most and you could start focusing your energy properly and creating protocols that are actually meaningful for you because the steps in that process of electron transport that I need are likely to be very different than the steps in the electron transport that you need. And so if we understand mitochondrial function and processing, and then we understand what my issues are and what your issues are, it'll start to become much more obvious which modalities and tools should I be implementing in my life and which modalities and tools should you be implementing in your life. And for the next series of the videos coming out from here, we'll start talking about which steps in the electron transport chain are actually modified by which of these modalities and tools so that you could start to better understand where you need to start placing your therapies for your protocols. I appreciate your attention. We'll see you next time.